Doctor. So welcome everybody. And I'll hand over to Tom Ze, who will introduce our speaker for today. Hi everyone. Thank you all for coming, for joining us. And uh, it's with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker today, Ben Yang, Dr. Ben Yang. He is a professor of anthropology at the State University of New York at New Paltz. His research focuses on, I hope I got that word pronounced right, Paltz. His research focuses on class mobility, political attitudes, gender, sexuality, health, and religion with a regional focus on Brazil in other settings in Latin America. His recent publications include Precarious Democracy, just came out, Ethnographies of Hope, Despair and Resistance in Brazil, 2021, and Cynical Citizenship, Gender, Regionalism, and Political Subjectivity in Porto Alegre, Brazil, which is a very, very south of Brazil. He recently co-directed a three-year investigation funded by the National Science Foundation of political subjectivities among the demographic sector, once known in Brazil as in the past like 30 years as new middle class, focusing on perceptions of the 2013 through 2018 crisis that it's by now well known to everyone, right? Culture memory of authoritarian pasts and the rise of popular conservatism. Uh, currently, uh, uh, Dr. Young is on sabbatical, uh, doing a writing fellowship at SAR in Santa Fe. And his talk today is called Precarious Families, Generational Tensions as a Working Class Household from, Brazil, from Recife in the Northeast of Brazil, as he describes on the, 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 the bump right there in South America, the furthest into the Atlantic Ocean, right? Brazil contemplates the eight, 2018, as Brazil contemplates the 2018 presidential elections that, uh, you know, Jair Bolsonaro came to power. I just I wanna add that, that's not part. Okay, uh, Ben, uh, um, thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation. We were thrilled by your acceptance and um, let's enjoy it. Thank you. All right, my pleasure. Let, I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Does that look okay? All right, very good. Um, so uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, uh, especially to uh, Professor Tom Zé Bastelar da Silva and also to Professor uh, Jennifer Rothgarden for the invitation uh, to be here. It's great to visit uh, your campus and the Latin American Studies program, albeit virtually, but uh, in all seriousness, it's really nice to, um, to meet you all. Um, I am broadcasting from Santa Fe. And yes, that is a virtual background. I'm not actually outside, but that is more or less what it looks like where I am. Um, I'm a lucky guy. I'm on sabbatical until next summer. Um, and um, I'm at the School of Advanced Research and uh, it's a lo really lovely environment to, uh, to write a book. Um, I'm stretching the rules a little bit uh, because I love coffee, but I can't drink it uh, afternoon or it gets with my sleep. So instead I'm going the Brazilian route uh, I began my experience in Brazil in the deep south of Brazil where they drink mate. So I've prepared mate and I'll be drinking mate from time to time um, uh, during my talk. All right, so the um, <clears throat> core of my presentation today is an ethnographic analysis of intergenerational tensions as they shape political sensibilities among a family from a peripheral neighborhood in the Northeastern city of Hesifi. The narratives of this family are the basis for a book that I'm writing currently while I'm here um, in Santa Fe. And as such, it is a work in progress. Um, you'll be getting some findings, but also I'll be grateful for your critical feedback um, afterwards. Before uh, I talk to you about the, the actual research, I wanna map out the context and the historical backdrop for the research. And I also want to uh, tell you a bit more about my broader research profile because I'm only presenting a little piece of it today. Okay, let's see. Hold on, let me get all of this on the screen. There we go. So here we go. 
Around 2010, Brazil seemed to be a country on the rise. With the 2014 World Cup and the 2016 Summer Olympics secured, Brazil's international reputation as an emergent world power with firm democratic and economic foundations seemed assured. After decades of economic instability, the years following the 2002 election of President Luis Inacio Lula da Silva of the leftist workers party, he goes by Lula as probably many of you know, those years were characterized by economic growth and the massive reduction of poverty and inequality. During Lula's two terms in office and the first term of his PT successor, Joma Rousseff, an estimated 35 million people rose above the poverty line. The emergence of this demographic sector, the so-called new middle class, was celebrated as evidence of Brazil's entrance onto the world stage, stage as a modern nation. While there is some debate about who gets the credit for this extraordinary transformation, most agree that both macroeconomic factors, for example, rising Chinese demand for Brazilian exports and government initiatives in the form of social welfare programs, uh, increasing minimum wage, greater access to higher education, were all crucial factors in this incredible demographic transfer transformation. There is little doubt, however, that without the social welfare programs implemented under 14 years of Workers Party or PT rule, programs like the uh, world famous Bolsa Familia, which is the world's largest conditional cash transfer program, without programs like, like those, the scale of poverty and inequality reduction would have been massively diminished. In this sense, uh, Brazil's new middle class, we could say, owes some of their mobility, maybe most of it, to the PT from a certain perspective. Okay. Sorry about that. I missed that picture. All right, let me make sure I've got everything up here. Um, the optimistic moment abrend, uh, 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 ended abruptly in 2013 when demonstrators protested increased bus fares, bloated expenditures on the World Cup and Olympic Games, and diminishing social support from the government. In 2014, greater numbers of protesters mobilized against corruption and called for President Jilma Rousseff's ouster. Incited by the conservative national media conglomerate, uh, conglomerate Global, the protests were marked by expressions of rage against Lula, against Jilma, and against their party, the PT. By the time Joma Rousseff was impeached in 2016, Brazil was facing the worst recession in 25 years. Meanwhile, unemployment and inflation were on the rise and former excitement uh, about Brazil's new middle class had more or less evaporated as many members of this demographic group fell back below the poverty line. The reversal of fortune that I've described is the national context for my own research and for the book project uh, that I'll be describing for you. And it's the so-called new middle class, a group which I now instead refer to as Brazil's once rising poor, that is the demographic sector I'm interested in in my own work. Uh, as many of you know, in 2018, just a couple of years ago, uh, Lula, uh, former president Lula, began a 12-year prison sentence after having been found guilty for corruption, though he was released in November of 2019. Uh, and as I think everyone knows, 2018 was the year uh, uh, of victory for far-right presidential candidate uh, Jair Bolsonaro over his PT opponent. Um, and uh, I think I'll say, uh, without taking too much time with this, that Bolsonaro's victory, uh, I think it revealed a certain, uh, a certain in inadequacy in how scholars from the social sciences, and I very much count myself among them, have understood the political affinities of poor and working class people in Brazil. We take seriously the effect of real and growing discontent over political corruption and violence on how poor people vote. Nonetheless, many of us were astonished that so many poor Brazilians would vote against a party that at least officially 
prioritizes the reduction of poverty and inequality in favor of a man who publicly questions whether democracy is superior to dictatorship uh, as a form of government and is homophobic, sexist, and racist to boot. My research does not seek to definitively answer this question, but it does aim to understand the precarious conditions under which a range of frustrations, anxieties, and dashed hopes might congeal into a vote for a populist, hard conservative outsider like Bolsonaro. I am of course aware that support for similar figures in other parts of the world um, has been on the rise in recent years. But to be clear, I'm not trying, in my own work, I'm not trying to explain the global spread of popular conservatism. And frankly, I tend to lean against assertions that Bolsonaro is the Trump of the tropics. If those assertions detract from understanding the specificities of Brazil's story. All right, so the conditions of economic and political crisis I've just described are the backdrop for all of the research and writing projects I've been involved with over the past several years. From 2016 to 2018, I was one of three principal investigators on a project funded by the National Science Foundation uh, to understand uh, how, uh, the experiences, how the experiences of um, excuse me, I have a little typo in my notes, to understand uh, how experiences of socioeconomic mobility and precarity among the so-called once rising poor impacted everyday life material conditions and have influenced political views, class identifications, and cultural memory. I'm particularly interested in how dashed hopes, the dashed hopes of the new middle class uh, have influenced political values, attitudes, and behaviors, especially as they took shape in the months leading up to the 2018 presidential elections. Um, so uh, a little bit of a theoretical moment in my talk. Uh, I can certainly talk more about this later on if, if you would like me to. Um, so structures of affect uh, accompanying these dashed hopes Brazilians seem reminiscent of the cruel optimism queer theorist Lauren Berlant has associated with late capitalism, whereby dreams of a better life and a sense of forward momentum erode as the social institutions that once offered upward mobility themselves fall apart. For previously rising or ascendant Brazilians, the experience of a reversal of fortune the capsizing of an earlier subjective sense that things were getting better has left a distinctive mark on political views, perhaps conferring its own variety of resentment towards and alienation from progressive politics and democratic political institutions more generally. Um, I'm gonna actually skip over a little bit um, uh, just cause I wanna get to the uh, ethnography. Um, I, 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 I just wanna, indicate that I'm, I also have an, uh, an engagement with the anthropology of middle class uh, literature, particularly um, for, the, for those of you who are interested in this, an excellent volume called The Global Middle Classes Theorizing Through Ethnography um, uh, that uh, came out in 2012, um, just as I was getting this uh, project together. And that book and that uh, still emerging work looks at the anxieties um, that shape middle-class subjectivities. Um, that's kind of a quick summary of it. I'm also engaging some work on cultural memory, um, how states promote uh, remembering the past. Certainly that's very meaningful in Brazil where there was a military dictatorship in living memory of people who are at least 60 years old. Um, and also how people use, even people who weren't alive during those years, invoke those memories to make sense of the present. Um, the project, this big collective project uh, that I did, it took place in three cities. You can see Recife in the Northeast Coast. Uh, we also had um, Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. And here I'll just acknowledge my colleagues who coordinated the field work in Rio and Sao Paulo, Sean Mitchell from Rutgers University and Charles Klein uh, from Portland State University. We combined over a three year period, we combined a range of ethnographic interviewing and observational techniques. 
um, including a, a structured uh, household survey, which we conducted with 400 uh, residents in each of the three cities. Um, and during the, the, the second and third year of the project, uh, a range of, of more focused qualitative activities, uh, research activities with adult family members of different generations and key community figures, such as business owners, neighborhood association leaders, church leaders, uh, and local elites. I'm happy to talk about the methodology if, if anyone wants to during question and answer. It's very complicated and long and, um, and not directly relevant to what I'm presenting today. Uh, a bunch of pu uh, papers and publications have come out of this grant so far, or hopefully will before long. Some of these are quantitative and based on our survey data set. Others lean toward a more qualitative ethnographic sensibility. Some of them involve collaborative analysis and writing. Some of them are just me. Uh, as a whole, to give you some glimpse of what we've been finding, uh, what we've done so far reveals a once rising poor that is economically precarious, doesn't invest in identification with popular class labels, least of all middle class, even though they were called the new middle class, and is significantly alienated from formal politics. Uh, forgive the shameless promotion. This is a, uh, the most recent book that uh, touches on this work. Um, if you're interested, uh, it's, uh, it's just come out. It has 15 evocative ethnographic accounts of how Brazilians from diverse walks of life have experienced and responded to economic precarity, crisis, and diminishing hopes for the future over the last decade. Um, you can get a discount uh, that'll bring the paperback price down to about 28 bucks if you use that code. Um, and if you don't write it down and you want it, just uh, let me know later on. Okay, I'm not going to um, talk about each of these photos. I, I like to have this slide to say, to just make a very basic point that I think any of the anthropologists and uh, here today will uh, appreciate, which is that field work is about more than just data collection, right? Um, so field work involves packing up our lives here, um, which you see an image of. It involves reconnecting with old friends, watching the World Cup, that's in the next photo going uh, kind of row by row. Uh, I, the last time I was in Brazil uh, for an extended period of time in 2018, I was teaching. So there's teaching a class, working with research assistants who helped me immensely with transcription and everything else, attending political events, public political events, down on the bottom row now, making sense of creepy political propaganda that uh, you know, populated the urban landscapes in Brazil in those, those months leading up to the elections. Occasionally talking to uh, the news, I try and keep a low profile, but occasionally one is discovered. So these are all, and then finally, the last photo was the, the actual day of the elections in uh, 2018. Sometimes field work means you escape the field and just tune out reality for a few precious hours. So all of this is a part of an anthropologist uh, doing field work. Okay, so um, this is the neighborhood um, where I've been working. And the book that I'm writing uh, this year explores how the period leading up to the divisive 2018 elections uh, was experienced by once rising poor families in the Recife neighborhood where I resided during field work. And that's a neighborhood that I refer to and it's a pseudonym as Mojo Dosi, which translates as sweet hillside. Mojo Dosi is home to about 30,000 residents and it's situated about 45 minutes by bus from Hisifi's downtown center. And so the, some of the images, a couple of the photos are just of the neighborhood. I think it will look, you know, in some ways like a very typical classy popular uh, Brazilian neighborhood. Down in the, down below, you can see the, um, the excellent uh, team of, of interviewers that I worked with. Uh, all of us, the four of us, um, did um, all of the qualitative interviews during the second uh, year of the project, um, and uh, we're being photobombed by the neighborhood hairdresser as well. As its common thread, the book that I'm working on centers on the narratives of one extended family, a family I lived with during field work and I referred to as the Pereiras. As I came to know the Pereiras, forging lasting relationships with the family's matriarch, whose name is Elena, 
um, and the families of her four children, I gained access to an incredibly rich set of narratives that speak to the hopes and frustrations of millions of once rising poor Brazilian families in times of growth and crisis. My account of the Pereira family uh, and other once rising poor families um, draws from my own field notes, from informal and structured interviews and from observations, both face-to-face -face and online. I first met the Pereiras in 2017 when I was introduced to Elena, the matriarch, through a mutual friend from her neighborhood who had worked for me on the big survey I mentioned earlier during the first year of our project. I rented a room from Elena for a few months that year, and in 2018, when I returned to Hesifi for seven months to teach at the local universe, uh, university, uh, I regularly visited the Pereiras to catch up on the family's comings and goings. Like many working class Brazilian families, the Pereira family has thrived in recent years. After years below the poverty line in 2018, the family's per capita household income rose to the category economists typically refer to as lower middle class. And the grandchildren had gotten into college through a federal affirmative action program targeting poor and non-white applicants. Over the, uh, over the past, 20 years, their house, and by the way, it's the, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but just to the right um, side uh, of the center of the photo, you can see two women standing outside of a kind of nondescript garage, and that's the Pereira's house. Um, over the last 20 years, their house, which was once a precarious hillside dwelling, has been fortified into a safe and stable residence in which Elena and the families of her children occupy separate households connected by maze-like hallways. The house sits on the neighborhood's main thoroughfare. Uh, the family's economic stability comes in large part due to gainful employment for most of Elena's children. Uh, her oldest son, uh, a fellow I'm gonna talk about in a minute, his name's Gabriel. He is a sergeant in the Brazilian army, which gives him a robust salary that provides financial security for the family and has enabled the purchase of a humble country house a couple of hours from Hesifi. Okay. So I'd like to read you now a, sh a short ethnographic narrative um, and some reflections that map out the terrain I'm exploring in the book. This section is called The Family's a Little Cross-Eyed. And I'm gonna, the next screen is blank and, I, and that's fine. <laughs> there are no pictures here. <clears throat> so the, the date of, the, of this uh, narrative is September 17th, 2018. For a large family like the Pereiras, birthdays are frequent and they come with the expectation of a party. So despite it being a busy weeknight, the extended family, a handful of neighborhood friends and I have assembled to commemorate Lucy Mar's 57th birthday. Her son, Lucy Mar's son, Carlinhos, shares some warm remarks about his mother. Quote, we decided to make this simple tribute to reciprocate the attention that Lucy Mar, his mother, has for each of us. Anyone close to her knows how sweet she is, how special she is, how dedicated, how hardworking she is, unquote. Lucy Mar is the daughter-in-law of the Pereira's matriarch, so Elena's daughter-in-law. Uh, Elena is a 63-year-old widow um, who seems content as she sits on the sofa and listens to her grandson, Carlinhos, speak. Elena has two sons, this part's a little complicated, uh, sorry about that. Uh, Elena has two sons and two daughters, so she has four biological children. All of them are married adults in their 30s or 40s. Her sons are Gabriel, the army sergeant I mentioned, and a guy named Edgy Milson, who is Lucy Mar's husband, and they're both here tonight, the two sons and their families. Um, uh, but uh, Elena's daughters, Sonia and Katya, are not here tonight. Sonia lives in another city with her husband and daughter, not too far along, away. She'll send uh, greetings on, on uh, WhatsApp before the evening is out. So she's present, she, she's just not physically present. And the other daughter, Katya, lives in Switzerland where a few years back she married a Portuguese guy and recently had a daughter. 
The party foods, an enormous chocolate cake surrounded by platters of empadas with their savory aromas wafting through the room are proving a distraction. And Carlino soon wraps up the homage to his mother. Quote, we wish you good energies, health protection, positive thoughts. We want you to enjoy every moment of your life with those who love you who, and respect you and cherish you, people who are a part of your life, each one present here, unquote. Someone launches into happy birthday to you, everyone knows this, who's been to Brazil, uh, parabéns para você, and uh, everyone sings and claps enthusiastically. Soon after the cake is served and people sit around for the next hour or so, chatting and snapping photos and videos to post on Facebook or send on WhatsApp. The, the photo Elena, the matriarch, posts, which I took at her request, shows the whole family flanking Luzimar. I'm only sorry, I can't show you this photo um, just as a, uh, a research ethics matter. Uh, I wasn't the only photographer at this moment. So my photo captures the family members gazing in slightly different directions, leading one of Elena's Facebook friends to comment, quote, a familia ta vesguinha, visi? which can very loosely be translated as the family looks a little cross-eyed, LOL, or something along those lines. Despite the usual intergenerational tensions, sibling rivalries and frictions with in-laws, the Pereiras, like most working class Brazilian families, manifest a powerful solidarity, supporting each other when times are tough and celebrating milestones such as birthdays, weddings, baptisms, and graduations. Still, there was palpable tension in the air on this particular night. As Luzi Mar's birthday fell just three weeks before the date set for Brazil's first round presidential election, uh, October 7th, 2018, and anticipation of the election had introduced new anxieties into everyday life for the Pereiras. On this night, uh, family members were indeed gazing in different directions different directions for their own lives and for Brazil. These were the elections that saw the extraordinary rise and eventual triumph of hard right candidate Jair Bolsonaro, a former army captain and seven term congressman from Rio de Janeiro. Relying on heavily on social media, uh, media, Bolsonaro took a tough stance on crime and defended traditional family values he promised austerity measures and cuts in government spending and vowed to stamp out crime and violence by providing greater access to firearms for ordinary citizens. The one family member openly supporting Bolsonaro, Elena's oldest son, Gabriel, the, uh, the uh, army uh, sergeant, had in recent weeks increasingly used his own Facebook page and the family's private sacred WhatsApp group uh, to praise his candidate and to argue the need to demolish the entire political establishment in Brazil. If asked about his support for Bolsonaro, Gabriel would likely mention at least one of the following themes. The need for a president who owes nothing to anybody and would thus be capable of bulldozing an irredeemably corrupt political system based on bribes. The problem of violence in public urban spaces and the promising solution of making gun ownership easier for the citizenry. The critique of human rights discourses which exacerbate violence by giving undue respect and legal protection to undeserving criminals, according to this discourse that uh, Gabriel mentions. The urgent need to reintroduce discipline respect and morality through a more structured vision of education. And finally, the need to keep the PT from ever assuming power again in Brazil. Gabriel, like Bolsonaro, often waxes nostalgic for the years of Brazil's military dictatorship when he imagines life to have been less chaotic and safer, a time when children respected their parents, students respected teachers, and criminals didn't receive special treatment. Particularly uncomfortable with Gabriel's support for Bolsonaro was his nephew, his nephew Everton, uh, that's Elena's grandson. Everton is gay, though at the time of the elections he was not out to his family. 
In private, however, the family regularly speculated about the sexuality of this beloved grandson. Gabriel, who at the time of the elections had no children of his own, was particularly anxious about the sexuality of his nephew, an anxiety that resonated with his concerns about the breakdown of morality and respect in Brazilian society and his ever intensifying conviction that the lion's share of blame for this lay with Lula and the PT. At the time of his mother's birthday party, Everton was several months into his first ever relationship with a classmate from his program at the university. And he felt a growing sense of disconnect between his vida sumida, his out life on campus and the secrecy at home. I myself identify as gay, and by the elections, most of the family was aware of this, uh, and perhaps offset by my status as an American uh, gringo with academic credentials seemed to have little issue. Nonetheless, background tension grew as Everton became uh, increasingly frustrated with his uncle's postings on Facebook and WhatsApp about the moral menace of homosexuality. For his part, Gabriel, the uncle, uh, grappled, uh, excuse me, uh, with, yeah, he grappled with growing, a growing disconnect between the long-standing affection he's always had with his nephew on the one hand and the in, uh, intensifying discord online, a disconnect that Gabriel perhaps linked to my own friendship with the family. There was some basis for this as I enjoyed a strong friendship with his mother, Elena, uh, with his wife, Patricia, and with Everton, his nephew, whom I've always tried to uh, support as he moves forward in constructing uh, a new sexual sub subjectivity. For other family members, uh, anxiety around the elections was less about Bolsonaro uh, than about a perceived destabilization of a more unified and a more social family dynamic. Elena, the matriarch for her part, had grown irate with the politicization of the family's WhatsApp group, as did Lucy Ma, the birthday girl, who considers voting a personal and private matter. Carlinhos, the, one of the other, uh, the grandsons who was speaking uh, at the party, hates Bolsonaro, but is non-confrontational by disposition, and perhaps more than anyone in the family, short of his grandmother, prioritized, prioritizes the maintenance of social harmony, over arguing political positions with friends and family. And he too had become weary of the growing rancor. With these background anxieties manifest at Luzimar's birthday party, uh, Carlinhos's speech was as much a call or a plea for family as a celebration of it. Um, I'm into the final chunk here. So with the narratives of the Pereira family at the center, my book that I'm already uh, working, I'm, I'm deep into, uh, will move through five major themes, uh, possibly each of which gets its own chapter. I'm still figuring this out um, and uh, taking my time with it. Um, so obviously, as you've seen just from the narratives that I've shared with you, there are intergenerational differences uh, there are concerns about sexuality and gender in relation to the moral fabric of society. There, um, <clears throat> are, uh, there is a, uh, a discussion about the role of the military in society, especially about um, uh, the possible militarization of education in Brazil. There are obviously uh, issues about cultural memory at play here and online social media. Um, I have a provisional title. We'll see if I stick with this. Family is everything, Brazil's new middle class uh, in times of crisis. I'm aware that this is a very wide thematic spread and that any one of these themes could take up an entire book. So it's important that the arguments and conceptual priorities be clear. I think that the book uh, it, it is in the end about the meanings of family and the tensions that become manifest in a moment of deep political and economic crisis following a period of massive poverty reduction and of course the rise of social media. I argue that the possibility of a shared vision of family, what it could mean, has been contaminated by the blurring of lines between public and private experience that is brought on by online social media in the anxious interactive flux 
of election season disputes, family for the Pereiras has become what I provision, have provisionally referred to as a strange public. The book as it's taking shape is a reflexive account, acknowledging uh, as you've seen, uh, and sometimes reflecting on my own positionality in and influence on the context I describe. Um, I wanna end my talk um, uh, with a, a, a glimpse of the future. And then uh, we can talk about all of this. So a couple of days after the final election, uh, in which uh, Bolsonaro emerged as victorious, uh, in, on October 28th, 2018, I received a ping uh, from Dona Elena on instant messenger, um, which is somewhat unusual uh, for her. Usually I have to write her and then she responds, but she writes me. And it's an image meme wishing a quote, blessed day for all of us. That's what it says. Uh, I quickly respond asking how Elena, how things have been since Sunday's election. And she replies, uh, I'm so happy. I'm so tired of my family bickering because nothing is going to change, but now things can get back to normal. For me, family is everything. And I'm glad now I can get back to normal. As I'm reading Elena's words, uh, a WhatsApp message arrives from Everton, the gay grandson with none of his customary greetings his text says only these elections have forever changed my perception of people close to me. To understand the, uh, unquote, to understand the political affinities of poor and working class Brazilians, as much attention needs to be given to women like Elena, who manifest extreme disinterest in politics, and men like Everton, for whom the 2018 elections created more feelings of disconnect and out of placeness uh, than solidarity within his family, as much attention needs to focus on women like Elena and men like Everton as it does uh, to men like Gabriel, who more obviously cultivate a quote, uh, conservative subjectivity, unquote. The future of the family and for Brazil, of course, meanwhile hangs in the balance. And that is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for an interesting and inspiring presentation and for a good um, you know, glimpse on the types of ethnographic work that you, that you do. I'll open the floor for questions. Um, we have um, a bit of time to take one or uh, three questions in a row. Let's see how it develops. So you could... Um, put questions in the chat or raise your hand. I think I see everybody on the screen to also respond to hand raising. Yeah, Jen, would you like to start? Sure, thank you. Um, thanks for this. And it obviously resonates with a lot of things I've seen, um, which of course also makes me want to ask you about the fact that there's a lot of overlap between this and the, what you see among the whiter middle class. But for the moment, unless you wanna like creatively bring that in, I, I, I would rather put that aside because I'm much more interested in having you talk a little bit more about the theoretical frameworks that you um, talked about using. And um, there was a lot of like tantalizing um, info there about what you're thinking with. So I'm um, wondering, I don't have any specific question other than hoping to hear you speak more on that and give you some time to do that. Okay, great. Um, would you like to uh, take another question or maybe answer to yeah, this question I, right away? Maybe let's get a one, maybe one or two more on the table, but I'll definitely mm. respond to, to Jen's question. Great. If I may sort of weave one in here, I'd, that also relates to Jen's question, is a question about methodology, in particular, the use of the voices that you have. And um, this is also for my students who work with oral history and who would like to know sort of how you make a voice representative. What is the degree of conclusions that you can draw? Mm -hmm. How do you connect those to other types of documents and evidence. Mm -hmm. 
so related questions on meth question on method. Shall I start by re responding to these two and you know um, or, I see no hand up at the moment. Maybe we give it a second. Sure, sure, absolutely. I think in the set, Tomze, you want to add <laughs> one here? Please go ahead. No, I think I can wait. Um, oh. Ben could address this too, and then okay. I'll, I'll pose mine. Okay, after. beautiful. We nice. do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Um, so, uh, Jen, I, I am glad you brought up, uh, even if it wasn't the main, uh, the main. Uh, focus of your question, the, how does this relate to kind of the traditional middle class, the elite middle class? Uh, and that is, um, uh, to be completely honest, uh, you know, uh, there is really, I mean, it's, it's a hole in our project that we focused on, uh, uh, primarily on, um, you know, political subjectivity among the once rising poor without integrating into our methodology um, the sort of old middle class because you can't actually, as I'm sure you know, and any, I mean, of, of course, um, anyone who's done work in Brazil has known that as a, a political subjectivity is, is, is relational, it's interactive, it's dialogical, it doesn't form, it, you know, it's, it's not a, a thing that kind of um, is limited to one person or one community. And so many, uh, so much of the kind of, you know, when I say political sense, this subjectivity, uh, the sense, one sense of self as a political subject uh, in relation to other communities, societies, populations, neighborhoods, um, you know, that's all relational. And so many of these people, you know, their sense of themselves as having a class identity or political identity, it comes from their work that they do in other parts of the city, their interactions with people who they think of, maybe they don't think of as a different class, but they think of as having a better life or better conditions de vida, life conditions. Um, so ju I just want to acknowledge that uh, a fuller analysis of political subjectivity and class subjectivity among the once rising poor must address uh, the old middle class, the elite middle class. And that's something we tried to fix uh, clumsily during the last year of the project, bringing in uh, elites from uh, working class neighborhoods, because every classy popular neighborhood in Brazil has wealthy people in it too. Um, and we tried to bring that in. But um, anyway, as far as theoretical framework, so um, I, I think, that, I mean, there are a bunch of things that, uh, that I'm playing around with and that um, with my colleagues, uh, Charles Klein and Sean Mitchell that we're working with. I think for now, I'm, I'm gonna just mention one of them, um, which is, um, and I'd welcome thoughts by the way um, from anyone, which is what I call in a kind of clum clumsy way, the dashed hopes hypothesis. Um, and that sounds a little bit more like a, a political scientist, all, uh, which I'm not all due respect to political science. Um, uh, but I get some of my inspiration from political theory here. So we know that people um, uh, who's, uh, there's a good literature, Latin American uh, study scholarship out there that suggests that people whose lives have gotten worse um, tend to become alienated from institutional politics. Um, okay, that seems almost like what we would expect. What I'm interested in is people whose lives got better for a, a little while, which the new middle class did, there's objectively speaking, um, uh, and then, and, and, and not only that the material conditions of their lives got better, but their, their let's say their aspirational horizons got better. They dared to, you know, Lula and the PT dared poor people in Brazil to dream of a better life with real hope and, and the sense that they could actually get that dream. Um, and, and not just objectively, if I could add to what you said, yeah. not just objectively, like subjectively. I mean, I talked to people too, who said, my kids have food in the refrigerator always. And when I was growing up, we didn't have that. Like they, mm -hmm. that's, you know, you can objectively measure that, but subjective, like that's their own personal experience. So it wasn't just their hopes, yes. they were experiencing a different kind of life. And I do like, by the way, your once rising. So I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Yeah, so exactly. So then um, what I'm interested in is what happens when you, your, your material conditions, your subjective sense has gotten better, life has gotten better, and that under a period of sustained period of leftist governance, um, uh, and and I you know I'm not a the PT is problematic in all kinds of ways so I'm not I'm not a defender of the PT but but you know this happened under a bona fide left wing party not a milk toasty center left wing party like the D Democratic Party but an actual left wing party um, what happens to the political sensibilities of people whose lives have gotten better and then the rug is pulled out. And what I'm seeing um, is that that is its own a particular formation that, um, but, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that anthropologists haven't focused too much on that specific pattern of when you've been dared to dream and then the, the, the bottom falls out. And what I see happening is that that's actually, um, I, I, as I said earlier in my talk, I'm not trying to explain Bolsonaro's election in any linear or singular way. I think that that's misguided to do that. I think that it's a confluence of factors that came together. Um, those of you who actually know electoral statistics in Brazil actually know that Bolsonaro did not get the majority uh, of votes. He won the election fair and square, but actually 60% of of the eligible electorate in 2018 did not vote for Bolsonaro. So it is wrong to say that Brazil turned conservative in, in 2018. The other thing, as I think many of you probably know, is that the vote is obligatory in Brazil. Um, anyway, so I'm not trying, with this idea of a dashed hopes hypothesis, I'm not trying to explain in a singular way or linear way Bolsonaro's election, only to say that it was as much about a, a sense of feeling kind of, um, uh, I'm sorry to use a pejorative term, screwed by democracy uh, that um, led sizable millions of Brazilians to um, feel just disconnected from electoral politics and democracy and voted accordingly. And, and that's different from an embrace of popular conservatism. And I think that to explain what's happening in Brazil as like a turn to the right is actually too heavy handed and doesn't deal with ambivalence and this question of dashed hopes. Um, Jadwiga, I, your uh, question is great actually, and I would have brought this up if you hadn't, um, the question of methodology. So, most of the work I do, we've, you know, this is the first time we're meeting, but if you knew me, you'd know that most of the work I do is actually much more positivist. And I'm, you know, I teach research methods in my university back in New York, and I'm very committed to, you have to have a clear relationship between your research questions, the methods, and the way you're going to analyze the data and come up with some sort of claim. So I'm all for that. And, um, and most of the data from the, the NSF grant is in that it, 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 it uses that way of thinking and knowing and that epistemology. Um, in our larger data set, we have very specific ideas about dashed hopes, about cynicism, about alienation that we develop questions about in the survey and in the qualitative ethnographic uh, study that we did during the second year. And we're, you know, we, we, when we analyze, for example, the transcripts using coding uh, that, um, you know, through, um, uh, we use MaxQDA for our software to analyze um, coded. You know, we're, we're always looking, we're always keeping, we're looking for recurrent patterns that either support or do not support our, the hypothesis under our research questions. Having said all of that, this book is different because it's a very interpretive, subjective, book for me, I will be, and I've never written a book like this, by the way, this is not my usual style of ethnographic writing or analysis. I'm, what I'm trying to do, um, the book is not only about the Pereira family, their narratives are the sort of center, but I will be bringing in um, uh, data from our broader uh, data set from the same neighborhood, because we 
did uh, you know I have uh, survey data and um, qualitative and observation data from other families in this neighborhood. So I will I am in a position to see uh, if the Pereira story uh, are representative of other working class once rising poor families in the neighborhood. But I'll just say um, I'm not sure you know that this is where you are going. But the question of voice is actually very complicated and challenging and intimidating for me because uh, this book is not collaborative, I'm writing it, but um, I wanna take some chances in the way I'm writing it. And I'm thinking, and, and also uh, there's an ethical issue, which is that I'm close friends with this family. I have their blessing to write this book. Um, uh, Elena, for example, when I asked the last time I saw her, I said, can I write a book about your family? And she said, well, Benjamin, Benjamin, we don't really understand what it is you do, but you seem like a nice guy and it's been great having you live with us. And then she looked at me and she said, and I know you would never bring disrespect or dishonor to my family. So that's the burden I have in writing this book. I've changed all the names and you know pseudonyms, so my my institutional review board is satisfied. But there's an and this book will eventually be in Portuguese, so they'll be able to read it. Um, and um, sorry, I'm talking a lot. Uh, what well, last thing? I'm considering possible way, uh, you know, possibly inviting um, some members of the family to to at least write something that I could possibly include or at least respond to. For example, Everton, um, I'd be interested to hear what he thinks. He knows I always share what I'm doing with him, um, but it'd be interesting. I, and I'm curious if, if, if folks have thoughts about um, just sort of the mode of ethnographic writing. That's a long-winded response. Uh, Tom Zay. <laughs> it is, I just, I just want to thank you for, for um, giving these very interesting insights into qualitative, quantitative uh, connections in the research. It's actually very intriguing um, work also in terms of who has the ultimate interpretive power. We spoke about, we speak about that a lot with oral history methodology, which is, you know, related. So yeah. thank you. Um, and Tom Zay, yes, please. Hey Ben, thanks for a great presentation. Yeah, I think you, you did a great job in just ex showing the complexity of the whole thing, right? So, and uh, and I I like the fact that you said that you're not trying to explain Bolsonaro's election or, or, or victory in linear terms and stuff. But I'd like to hear more about what um, from you um, because you mentioned like the the if, if we talk about axes, the, the economic axes, the moral axes. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of it, and and uh, and also the the issue of public safety, because one of the things that Lula did, the, the worst part of, of Lula years was the deterioration of public safety, right? Mm -hmm. um, that Lula really failed um, in terms of doing something about the the rise of violence, at city violence, urban insecurity, all that stuff, right? So can you um, just share your, your feelings about in, in the intersection of all these axes of what you, what you heard? Because, uh, and I have examples also with, even within my own family in Rio about that, right? That mm -hmm. building of living, especially living near the, 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 the favelas, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the closeness that these, the middle class and stuff uh, live to these, you know, um, um, my sister lives near the favela do Alemão, right? Mm -hmm. And I saw the whole thing, the whole thing about voting for Bolsonaro connected to, to this vulnerability that her family felt living so close to that. So can you just say more about this, um, what you heard in that family in terms of safety, uh, not just economic acts, losing the economic thing, the cri economic crisis, but also the deterioration of the, the idea of being safe in the city, right? Yeah, so um, uh, thanks for the question. It's, as I'm sure you know, that is a huge and very complicated issue. So I'm not gonna, I have a, a long version, but I, I'm not gonna give you the long version. Um, but I, I, I think what I wanna do is I wanna tell you something Donna Elena said to me one time when we were having a conversation that speaks to this issue, but from a kind of a, 
inductive mm -hmm. issue uh, aside from the from the ground up. Um, I was just talking with her privately. This is when I was living with her. I had been living in her part of the, the big house. I, by the way, I lived, so the, the house is divided into five different pesas, like, you know, separate apartments, each with its own lock on the front door. And I lived in Elena's. So it was, must have been pretty weird for her having this, you know, American guy like living to, you know, bed in the bedroom next to hers. Uh, but I did. And we, we hit it off. Anyway, we were talking one night. Um, and I said, you know, you're the only one in this household who actually is old enough to remember anything from the dictadura, from the dictatorship. And I said, so what do you think? What do you, what do you remember from those years? And she said, I know I'm not supposed to say this, but it was so much safer at, because no one messed with anyone in this neighborhood. And I never went down to the center where all of the you know, demonstrations were and the police were like killing people. I never saw any of that. It just was much safer and more tranquil in the, here in the periferia, in the periphery. Uh, and I, I know, I know, I, I know you're not supposed to say that, but I really miss that. And so I, for me, that was very powerful because she was not saying vote Bolsonaro. And she also wasn't saying, you know, human rights are just giving, you know, special treatment to banjitos or anything. It wasn't that kind of a ideological formation. It was an honest, raw expression of nostalgia, of missing those days when it actually was safer and quieter. And, you know, um, and as you pointed out, it is a fact across the big cities in Brazil that violence got and crime got in, in urban settings got worse. Um, under under the PT. So all I, I'm going to say, I'm not giving you a macro kind of connection here, uh, but since I'm interested in, in ambivalence um, more than, you know, clear ideological positions, I think that that expression is very interesting because it's, it's meaningful that she really missed days that were better and I don't know, I don't think she voted for Bolsonaro. I think she voted in blank, but she'll, she won't tell me. But just voting in blank is a, is a protest vote against the PT in 2018. So an indirect uh, response to your question. Well, thank you, it was great, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, one quick thing, oh, I see Sarah has her hand up. I'll send it to you over email. Right, right. That's so it is, it is two o'clock, so we'll take a last question, uh, please, Sarah. Hey there, just thank you so much. I'm working on my dissertation now, which focuses on precarity among what I might now call the once rising middle class in Peru. So this was incredibly helpful. And Great. I, I know this isn't the focus of your research, but I was just curious through the communication that you've been having like over the last couple of years, have you noticed changes in how the family thinks about Bolsonaro and has COVID-19? Um, and the, the tragedy that's really unfolded in Brazil in any way kind of reshaped how, how the family is thinking about politics. I'll give a quick response to that. I'm also, I really appreciate the question. I'm, paste, I'm putting my email into the chat box. I'd welcome staying in touch um, with any or, or all of you. And if you have an inspiration about something you think I should read that relates to the book I'm writing, please feel free. I'd be grateful. Um, so as far as your question goes, the, a, a short response, Sarah, apologies, is um, as far as COVID goes, uh, it's total devastation and it's still getting worse. Um, and there's no way to be optimistic at this moment. There is no way to sugarcoat it. Um, in the extended Pereira family, everyone in the family has had COVID. It blew through um, like most working class families in Brazil. There was, you know, in, in densely populated neighborhoods that where you have to walk up a, you know, a, a, a walking path that's three feet wide, there's no way to protect yourself from COVID in Brazil. Um, so, uh, and it's still getting worse. Um, and vaccine rollout is a mess. Um, I'm a fan of the universal healthcare system in Brazil, but it isn't being supported. So it's not working and it's utterly unable to, uh, to treat, treat people with COVID. So yeah, uh, and in the extended Pereira family, uh, two people have died uh, in the last 
Yeah, since this began of COVID. Um, none of the people I reported on today. As far as Bolsonaro goes, you know, I, I don't want to take up too much time with this, but um, uh, it's really hard to say um, what's going to happen. If we can believe the opinion polls, uh, if Lula is eligible, uh, which it looks like he will be, he'll win. Um, and in a sense, uh, in you know uh, next year's election, in a sense that's good news because anyone other than Bolsonaro is good news. But I, you know, it's it's a big problem. I, I hope this doesn't offend anyone. But um, part of what I think got uh, sorry, this is a provocation. Uh, part of what got Brazil into this mess is that Lula didn't cultivate a next generation of viable PT leaders. And so Lula is the best the PT can do. And that's a huge problem um, in, in, my, in my view. He's being made into a saint right now. And he's an inspiring man who did incredible things when he was president, but he is no saint. So sorry to end with a heavy pro provocation. I think it was great. I, <laughs> I, agree, I agree with you, yeah. Um, so thank you once again for such an interesting and stimulating conversation and also for your willingness to keep open the channels of communication Please. with those who didn't get to ask their question. Yeah. Um, and I hope that, you know, a lot of fruitful uh, communication can, uh, can come out of this. So um, thanks everybody. And um, I wish you a great rest of the week and a good weekend. And um, yeah, see you at the next Charles. Um, and thank good luck with the book. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we bring you back, man. Mm -hmm.